Hey there, welcome to Livewire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week on the show, we're talking to comedian, podcaster, friend of the program, and now author, Jamie Loftus. Her first book is out. It's called Raw Dog, The Naked Truth About Hot Dogs. It's part travelogue, part culinary history. Jamie will explain how exactly you go on a cross-country road trip when you also don't actually have a driver's license. Then we've got the poet Jose Olivares discussing his latest collection. It's called Promises of Gold. It's a really beautiful bilingual exploration of love in all of its forms. Then we're going to round out the show with some music from a lawyer turned musician, Danielle Ponder. Sorry, legal system. We, the uh, music lovers of the world, needed Danielle over on this side of things. Uh, you're going to hear some music from Danielle. So that is the plan. Stick around. Livewire gets started right after this. Ever wondered what it's like to live alone, hidden in the woods, not speaking to a single soul for 30 years? Or wander the desert, uncover a hidden well, and dive to the bottom of the deepest water hole for 2,000 miles? The Snap Judgment Podcast takes you there with amazing stories told by the people who lived them. Snap Judgment. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Elena. Ciao, Luke. How's it going? Oh, my goodness. Are you really that person now? I know you've been in Italy. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Ciao, Elena. Welcome back from being under the Tuscan sun. Are you ready to do a little station location identification examination? Si, cert. Si, si, si. Okay. This is the part where <laughs> of the show where I quiz Elena on a place in America where we are on the radio. She's got to guess where I am talking about. Okay. This place uh, was where a scotch tape was invented. Hmm, definitely a place with a lot of people who immigrated from Scotland. I don't think of this city as being associated overwhelmingly with folks from Scotland. Speaking, though, of which uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, was born in an apartment in this city and then later wrote the book The Side of Paradise in this place. I do believe you mean F. Scotch Fitzgerald, which... (laughs) <laughs> you could insert oh a joke about it, about his his love of liquor here, but uh, we won't do that. I feel like I really teed that one up for you with the, <laughs> the Scott and the Scotch. Okay, you sound like you know. Where where are we talking about? Well, like all card-carrying English majors, I know <laughs> that F. Scott Fitzgerald was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. Woo-woo! Absolutely right, where we are on the radio on KNOW, Minnesota Public Radio there in the beautiful Twin Cities. So shout out to them. Uh, You ready to do this radio show? Let's do it. All right, take it away. From PRX, it's... This week, podcaster and writer Jamie Loftus. I think it's like a nasty hot dog that will make you think, like, surely someone needs to answer for their crimes. (laughs) (laughs) And poet Jose Olivares... I want to write poems for the people that don't usually get them because we tend to think of poetry as something that is reserved for the romantic interest in our lives. With music from Daniel Ponder and our fabulous house band. I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now the host of Livewire, Luke Burbank. Thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone tuning in from all over the country, including the Twin Cities out there listening to KNO. W Radio. We have a great show in store for you this week. Of course, we asked the Livewire listeners a question in honor of uh, one of our guests' experience, Jamie Loftus, who wrote this book called Raw Dog about hot dogs. She drove all over the country eating hot dogs in different parts of America. The question we're asking the listeners this week is, what's your ideal road trip? We're going to have those responses coming up in a minute. First, though, it's time for the best news we heard all week. This is our little segment at the top of the program reminding us all that there is some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what's the best news you heard all week? Well, I know we're talking about road trips this week, and I would like to take a road trip south of here to San Jose, California, because of something that happened recently. There's a gentleman named Dr. Robert Moore. He was a dean at San Jose State for many years. He's long since retired. 
And Dr. Robert Moore recently became a centenarian. He's now a member Whoa. of the 100-year-old club. Woohoo! And his daughter, Allison, wanted to do something special for him. And she knows he is an avowed dog lover. So she got on next door and asked her neighbors to walk their dogs past his house at a designated time so he could enjoy those dogs as like a fun community birthday present. Uh-huh. What was probably like 10 dogs showed up, 12 dogs? She was hoping for 20, so kind of ambitious, I mean, I think. But (laughs) it turns Hmm. out that 250 dogs showed up. That next door ask went viral. The dogs showed up with their owners in costumes. Some of them had on tuxedos. Some of them had on cowboy hats. One lady just really wanted to come. She didn't have a dog, so she just brought a stuffed dog wearing like a fuchsia fedora. (laughs) They brought cupcakes and flowers and signs and uh, just filed past his house for what I'm assuming took at least an hour, if not more. And uh, Allison says that her dad pet every single dog that passed by, which is so cute. I love this story. I love the idea of this happening. And I'm not the only one. Actually, our listener, John Mock, actually told us about this story. So thanks for letting us know about that, John. Yeah. Hat tip, John. Thank you. My best news I saw this week also involves somebody who, well, they're listed in the headline as a granddad. Granddad wins gold in arm wrestling. (laughs) But... He's only 53, which the older I get, Elena, the younger granddads get, it would appear, because (laughs) this is the story of a guy named Mark Walden. Mark Walden, um, like too many people, uh, became very ill during COVID. He actually contracted COVID, and then uh, he turned into pneumonia. He was uh, living in the UK, and um, and while he, for there was a period of time that he was kind of not sure if he was going to make it. He was very, very sick, and... um, Luckily, he pulled through, and as he was convalescing and just trying to kind of pass his time while he was still in recovery, he started watching a lot of competitive arm wrestling videos <laughs> like on his computer, and he got really inspired. I guess he was always like a pretty strong person. He'd always gone to the gym. I've seen a picture of him. He's a big guy. He's a buff granddad. <laughs> He's a real buff granddad. You might even call him a granddaddy. I don't know. Whoa! But he- <laughs> He decided if he, you know, made a full recovery, he was going to uh, get into competitive arm wrestling. And so he did. He got better. And then he started entering these arm wrestling competitions, and he was losing all the time. Oh, no. Because even though he was a big, strong person, he didn't have the specific muscle groups, like, in his hand and forearm that you need to be really, really top level at arm wrestling. And so he said he studied those muscle groups and started going to the gym to just work out those muscles. And he says the hardest part of his training was not even physical. It was kind of mental because he felt very silly at the gym, <laughs> like doing some kind of pinky press. Or... Yeah, I'm imagining all of his fingers having little sweat bands on, you know, like <laughs> and that, like while they do like like thumb squats yes. or whatever. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, but he, I guess he overcame the embarrassment because he recently won – Two gold medals at the IFA European Championships in Finland. Whoa. So his dream that he that he sort of had while he was just, you know, not doing well with COVID has now come true. He is a European champion. Uh, he dedicates all of it to his grandkids. He's got a Aww. daughter named Grace, which is a great name. It's my daughter's name as well. And uh, she calls her granddad the Hulk. <laughs> hey, what is that like to grow up calling your granddad the Hulk? Like that's a far cry from... How we regarded Farnham Burbank yeah. back in the day. We called my granddad Beepaw, which I don't think, uh, well, it doesn't mean anything, but it definitely doesn't mean Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Beepaw, you know, or Peepaw, or those those are more granddadish names right. than, than the Hulk. Hulk. But anyway, <laughs> the amazing accomplishments of Mark Walden, a buff granddad at 53. That is the best news that I heard all week. All right, let's invite our first guest on over to the show. She's an Emmy-nominated writer and comedian whose work the New York Times describes as unexpectedly gripping explorations of niche subjects. Uh, Some of those niche subjects include Mensa, which is the high IQ society, although if you're in that, I didn't have to tell you. The book Lolita, which she pointed out has been misunderstood by a lot of people over time. And then also she took on the comic strip Kathy, who was actually doing a lot more than just saying, ack, and I'm a chocoholic. 
Uh, her latest project is the New York Times bestselling book, Raw Dog, The Naked Truth About Hot Dogs. Take a listen to this. It's our conversation with Jamie Loftus here on LiveWire. Hi, Jamie. Welcome back to the show. I'm so happy to be back. Um, it turns out that you're not only an amazing podcaster, you're an amazing writer. Um, was there a specific hot dog that you were having <laughs> or like a moment where you thought, yes, uh, this, this should, nay, this must be a book about this, hot dogs? <laughs> I think it's like a nasty hot dog that will make you think like, surely someone needs to answer for their crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Because my, my dad, he's, like, sick of me repeating this in public, but he would do these really gnarly, like, boiled hot dogs mm. that was very, like, dad's around right now. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, gonna, he's about to make an attempt. And so I always, like, associated this nasty, mushy meat tube with, like, <laughs> we did it. We're a family. <laughs> I don't know. I, I really love uh, talking and thinking about hot dogs because it is like even when it's disgusting, it always feels very personal because uh, mm. most people uh, start eating them when they're very young. Mm -hmm. And it can be a very, very gross food that people will like absolutely die for because it reminds them of something uh, important to them. Mm. Um, can you explain what the parameters of uh, hot dog summer 2021 were? You went on this road trip to just kind of experience different hot dogs in different parts of the country. And uh, also, yes. uh, you don't have a driver's license? Yeah. No. <laughs> that seems like or a pet sitter. Right. Or that seems like <laughs> step one of, a, of an epic road trip would be driver's license. No, you just need a, a boyfriend, and then ah, okay. you don't need a driver's license. But yeah, no, my, my ex and myself and our, both of our animals, uh, I, I got hired to write this book um, shortly after we had been vaccinated, and about like a week into the trip, uh, the Delta variant really started kicking up, and it was like we were already kind of stuck you know, and so it was it was a very I think like I didn't let myself process it at the time because it's such a silly reason to be outside of your home is to eat 200 <laughs> hot dogs. <laughs> but I was contractually obligated to eat 200 <laughs> hot dogs. And it was like, we have to do it. We have to do it safely and we have to do it together. And I cannot drive the car. <laughs> I think a lot of these I think a lot of these public radio types and, and honestly, myself included, Jamie, are are kind of thinking like, aren't hot dogs terrible? Like on every level for us, for the animals. How do you, a socially conscious entertainer and writer, Jamie Loftus, square all of that? Well, it's uh, they're definitely bad for you. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, they're uh, worse for the pig, right? Oh yeah, Ooh. arguably harder to be. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the animals are always going to have sort of the worst deal in hot dogs. Although there are uh, an increasing number of uh, vegan and vegetarian options that don't suck. I swear. Mm. They I, exist. I've, I've wandered the earth looking for like <laughs> a, a plant-based hot dog that has the snap. You talk about the yeah. snap a lot in this book. I, I would love to meet the person who can replicate uh, animal skin breaking in your mouth with That's a plant. That's all I want. <laughs> Because that's what it is. I'm a simple man. And I want someone to make a plant-based thing that reminds me of snapping through the innards of an animal. I, I truly think that a, a vegan that could accomplish that is a real sicko. <laughs> it's a weird mission. But yeah, I mean, it's I, I try to say at the beginning of the book, like, vegans are correct. Vegetarians are correct. Meat consumption is always going to be some sort of mental and ethical compromise. And so when I was researching how hot dogs are made, uh, it was about uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, the meatpacking industry was going through such a horrible time during lockdown, especially because of the Trump executive order to keep meatpacking uh, plants open, which essentially that executive order, it was revealed in late 2021, possibly early 2022, that was like drafted by the CEOs of Tyson and Smithfield. Hold on, let me sit down. <laughs> let me sit more down. You're telling me mm -hmm. a major agribusiness had a direct line to the Trump White House. Yes, they did. Mm. But 
But it's so, I mean, it's like, that's not shocking. And then you read about the individual cases of how in, uh, individual workers and families were affected by that. And it's stuff that you, that is like truly sickening to have to face on a very human level. And that's not to speak of how they treat the animals. Um, and so I think like I had to reach a point where I was really hoping by the end, I'm like, mm, I'm going to be such a good person by the time I finish writing this book. <laughs> I am never going to eat meat again. Like I am going to be, I'm going to go clear, <laughs> and, right. um, which I didn't. And I, I still don't really know why I think that like, I've never not eaten meat and it was really, I found it pretty impossible to stop. And so what I have been trying to do is to just not eat from Tyson and Smithfield and mm -hmm. try to eat uh, more ethically when I can. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll say goodbye to sponsors, Tyson and Smithfield. <laughs> we had a great run. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, all right, we got to take a quick break here on Livewire. Uh, we're going to be back uh, with Jamie Loftus. Her new book is Raw Dog. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Hey, welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarella. We are at the beautiful Alberta Rose Theater right here in Portland, Oregon, and we're talking to Jamie Loftus about her new book, Raw Dog, The Naked Truth About Hot Dogs. Let's get into the five hot dogs you can purchase easily in heaven. Okay. This is basically the Mount Rushmore of hot dogs that you lay out in the book. Um, and uh, we'll just kind of go through them rapid fire. Uh, number one on the list appears to be the Costco hot dog. What is, okay. what's so, so special about the I Costco? Need to, I would like to stress easily purchased. They're not the best hot dogs. Right. They're just the ones that you can Are definitely most available. have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Costco. Costco, everyone is uh, always losing their minds every six months about how the CEO of Costco hmm. threatened to kill someone. This, this email, right, that comes up all the time. It was a Jim Senegal, I think, that yes. saying he's going to like fire the guy if the price of the hot dog and soda go up by five cents or something? He says he's going to uh, effing murder him. Oh. <laughs> yeah. if he, which is a great story, but I always, like, people always send that to me, and I was like, there, you got to consider the hero of this story is a billionaire CEO of Costco. Um, I also think that story was published in, like, Costco Connections, which is the yeah. newsletter for Costco. Which is the whole thing with, like, I mean, hot dogs and, like, all sorts of marketing, where you're like, they're making it up, and you're circulating it like you just found out Keanu Reeves was a nice guy for the first time. <laughs> like, I just, I, I, I have higher expectations of internet users, which is on me. Hmm. Uh, what about the... <laughs> Oh, what about the Home Depot hot dog? Okay, Depot dog, that's something special. Uh, so I don't actually know if... Do you, does the Pacific Northwest have Depot dogs? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was growing up, they did. And okay. the way that that little kind of foyer area, you know what I mean? Like you're, mm -hmm. you're in the, the Home Depot, but you're not all the way in, yeah. would smell like the hot dog uh, cart. Uh, it's so good. So they're independently owned hot dog carts outside of Home Depot. Why? Shut up. <laughs> it's great. There's like certain areas where like we do taco stands. We do like diff there's different kinds. There's hero stands, stuff like that. But like Depot Dogs, no matter where you go, everyone is always so thrilled. And like there have been uh, state representatives that have spoken out when Depot Dogs stands have closed. Because um, Home Depot after a while was like, what is going on? Like we're not getting a cut of this. And... Then public officials were like, you cannot shut down that hot dog stand. My aunt loves those hot dogs. <laughs> what about hot dog on a stick? They also make the list. They do. They may, they, because it's an easily gettable hot dog. Hot dog on a stick, you know, is fine. It's, uh, is it's, that where they wear the hats? 
That's where they wear the sexy little outfits, yeah. It's a weird one. It's just like a sexy little hot dog that comes out of sexy little muscle beach. And you eat it, and you're like, nah, fine. <laughs> uh, then you have Auntie Anne's. Yes, Auntie Anne's fascinating. If no one knows the story of Auntie Anne, it is so wild. She grew up uh, in an Amish community in Pennsylvania. She and a number of women in her community uh, were survivors of sexual abuse from a priest in their community. No one saw this twist coming. I swear this ends it with a hot dog. Uh, <laughs> I have to cut the tension in the room because it is very scary. So, so there is an abusive person in their community. They speak to each other about it. They force this priest out of the community. And uh, Auntie Anne and her husband decide they want to start a community center for women who have survived sexual abuse. But they don't have any money. So Auntie Anne decides she's going to start making pretzels. <laughs> And now she's a pretzel gajillionaire. It's so... And then she did speak at the Republican National Convention. So, mm. you know, it's... Com I, yeah, I know what your politics are. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hot dogs. Like, you gotta... Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's an American story. You, <laughs> yeah. you buy the ticket, you it's take true. the ride. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. We're talking to Jamie Loftus about her book, Raw Dog. Let's talk about a place that you visited that I used to also go to Ooh. often about two in the morning when I lived in Washington, D.C., and that would be Ben's Chili Bowl, yes. home of the half smoke. Yes. Um, and uh, what, what did you think of the hot dog, and also why was that place of particular interest to you? Oh, I mean, that business is fascinating for a number of reasons. It's uh, one of the few black-owned hot dog businesses that I covered uh, throughout my travels. There's not many, especially um, ones that have as huge an impact. There's all of this lore, like D.C.-based lore, uh, connected to Ben's Chili Bowl, where allegedly... Um, MLK began writing the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> There's a lot You can't of say that about an Auntie Anne's. Yeah. No. There, there's like all like like Stokely Carmichael was said to have gone there a lot. Like there's all of these famous uh, civil rights figures that would hang out at Ben's Chili Bowl eating a delicious hot dog that will make you poop so much, um, <laughs> and like having the time of their lives. And they're like they're I I just think it's like really wonderful when hot dog business owners become local celebrities, mm -hmm. uh, because almost every sitting president I think since that business has been open, it's like a part of like okay I got voted into office I have to go to Ben's Chili Bowl to take a picture with this, like, chili-soaked hot dog. <laughs> and I think that that's great. I also noticed across the country, uh, Jimmy Fallon has been to every hot dog place in the entire world. Because there's a picture of him? Yeah, I was just like, go to work. I don't know. <laughs> it's, like, really bizarre. I thought you were going to say, like, Guy Fieri or something. He's I'll be in a random place sometime and just look up, and he'll just be there with, like, his Oakleys on backwards, just, like approving of this gas station bathroom I'm in or something. <laughs> like, like, man, he's been everywhere. There is a place I went to in North Carolina that I don't know what the theming of the restaurant was before Guy Fieri went there because it seemed like the theme was Guy Fieri's been here. <laughs> <laughs> he was everywhere. <laughs> uh, you also went to the Nathan's famous uh, hot dog Hell competition. Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. Fans of uh, people dunking their hot dogs in water, water before they eat them, which is, for some reason, the part Watch that really, <laughs> really upsets me about that whole process is that, you know, that's the most effective way to eat, you know, 50 hot dogs, right, is to dunk them in water first. Yes. What did you make of that whole spectacle? Oh, I hated it at first. I, I intentionally, like, went into that pretty, like you know, raw. I didn't know very much. I was like, I'm just going to let this experience wash over me and see how I feel at the end. Because it's a 10 minute long competition. And I just felt my feelings change in real time where it starts. <laughs> and it's like Joey Chestnut wins every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he like dunk, split, chomp, chomp, swallow. He ate 76 in 10 minutes. No, you should be cheering. <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, it was so like, I started off so not on his side. I was like, this is, this should be illegal. <laughs> and then at some point in the middle, I was like, no, this is a sport. And, <laughs> and then the guy on ESPN, I will never forget it. Like you can check the 2021 broadcast said that Joey Chestnut eats hot dogs the way Ernest Hemingway wrote novels. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> and like, with no adjectives. <laughs> like, yeah. That guy, the, the guy who announces them, <laughs> he's this PR guy from New York, and he yeah. like inherited this little kind of not particularly notable like hot dog eating competition, and then in and I think he wanted to be a writer. Right, he and, did, and yeah. so yeah. he now gets out all of his sort of writerly Im instincts in how he describes the competitive eaters. It's yeah. so intense. Yeah, it's <laughs> this guy George Shea who I think is made his living kind of being like, "I'm the Vince McMahon of hot dogs." Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, "Well, I hate that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't want that." But it's like has the showmanship of uh, Vince McMahon and also a lot of the things that people hate about Vince McMahon uh, because there's he has this whole history as does this contest of really uh, making and breaking like lives have been ruined I'm a huge fan of uh, Takeru Kobayashi the mm -hmm. greatest hot dog eater to ever do it um, and he was like really really screwed over by mm -hmm. uh, by George Shea and by Major League Eating uh, for reasons that were that's the name of the what's league what's so funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is called Major League Eating, and we can laugh about that. <laughs> but uh, Kobayashi was this amazing eater who came over from Japan, popularized uh, the hot dog eating contest, mm -hmm. is a huge reason that it was on ESPN and all this other stuff. And then uh, once there was a white American champion in the form mm -hmm. of Joey Chestnut to present a challenge, uh, George Shea and Major League Eating did everything they could to make Kobayashi's deals worse and worse and worse wow. until he was essentially forced out of the sport. Mm. I feel so strongly about it. And uh, not to mention that the women's contest is still broadcast on ESPN3, which makes me want to shove my hand in a garbage disposal. Like, why is that? And, and Shea is the one who made it split by gender. It used to be that women would be in the hot dog eating contest along with the men, right? Yeah, everyone eats food. Like, <laughs> it's so weird that it's split like that. But yeah, that was an intentional decision by George Shea in 2011 huh. to split the contest. And originally, um, the women competitors were told at a tea party he threw for them because he's a bit evil. Mm. So he threw them this tea party, said, you're going to be on ESPN3 now. Uh, the men's prize is still $10,000. Yours is $2,500 now. Mm. And here's this new pink belt we got you. Right, the belt oh, is pink. Nice. <laughs> right. It's technically the Pepto-Bismol belt, but it was still a huge, like, ugh. <laughs> I mean, what I think is so interesting about this book and even about this conversation we're having, Jamie, is that this the hot dog seems like this kind of just silly thing that, you know, we consume mindlessly, and yet we've already touched into, like, two or three really big cultural things around gender and and class and all of the stuff that's tied up in it. Mm -hmm. Because it's so uh, sort of inherently American at this point, it also brings with it all of the weirdness of this country, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, like a symbol. And we're told that it's a very American symbol. But like, why? Who did right. that? And what does an American, like an American symbol, is that a good thing? <laughs> like, right. Do we have to feel good about that? And I, I tried to explore it from every way that I could because I love hot dogs still. They're the best. Uh, <laughs> I can and have talked about them for hours on end and I will continue to. But there's also so many uh, things about you know hot dogs that uh, are connected to yeah like systems of exploitation and oppression in America. And also uh, people have sex on the Wienermobile. So there's a lot going on. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jamie Loftus everyone. The book is Raw Dog. That was Jamie Loftus right here on Livewire, recorded at the Alberta Rose Theater here in Portland. Her new book, Raw Dog, The Naked Truth About Hot Dogs, is available now. Special thanks this episode to Mark and Jamie Luce of Muckle Tio, Washington. Mark and Jamie are part of the Livewire member community, and they are generously supporting our show with a donation each month, and we are very thankful for that because it is genuinely what allows us to keep Livewire going. So a big thanks to Mark and Jamie out there in Muckle Tio, Washington. This is Livewire. Our next guest's debut book of poetry, Citizen Illegal, was named a top book by NPR and The New York Times. His latest collection of poetry, Promises of Gold, is a bilingual exploration of love in all of its forms. It's truly beautiful. Let's take a listen to this. It's Jose Olivares at the Alberta Rose Theater here in Portland. Hi, 
Jose, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for traveling all the way from Jersey today to be here in Beaverton. You know, all in a day's work. <laughs> yeah, man. You write in the foreword of, of your new book that you wanted this to be a book of love poems for your homies, uh, you know, kind of your non-romantic friends, but then it didn't exactly turn out that way. What happened? So I, I had the idea for the book before the pandemic started. And so in my mind, I'm like, this is a pretty straightforward book of poems. I want to write poems for the people that don't usually get them because we tend to think of poetry as something that is reserved for the romantic interest in our lives, right? My friend Nate says that we usually go to poetry in times where someone's either getting married or buried, right? <laughs> um, and so in my mind, I'm like, I want to kind of fill in the gaps. And then when the pandemic happened, all of my language became a lot darker and I realized how much fear I was living with and how much uncertainty, I mean, and anxiety was just kind of filling my poetry. And so the poems themselves are, are kind of aiming at this type of love while a lot of times landing in uncertainty and anxiety and all of those other emotions. I'm curious about your growing up years and words and poetry and things like that. Were those in your life growing up in, uh, it was Illinois? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in Calumet City, Illinois, in the south suburbs of Chicago. And also my parents are immigrants. They came from Jalisco, Mexico. So English is my second language. And so that means for a large part of my life, I was often very quiet because I didn't want to mess up the language and have people laugh at me, right? I didn't want to mispronounce anything. And so I was used to kind of living in that quietness, and, but I was always listening. Like, I loved language. Even when I couldn't fully understand English, I loved the way my peers would kind of like flip words and make up phrases on the fly. And so uh, what poetry allowed for me was it gave me a chance to think about like, do I really want to be quiet or is this quiet something that has kind of been put upon me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was kind of asked to write my own poems, I was like, it turns out I have all of this language that I've just been kind of storing and thinking about for all of these years. Can we actually hear something um, from the book? I was hoping that we could hear uh, Ode to Tortillas. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so this poem is called Ode to Tortillas. It was inspired by eating tortillas. <laughs> it's deep, you know what I mean? Poetry. How does it happen? Who knows? Ode to tortillas. There's two ways to be a Mexican writer that we've discovered so far. You can be the Mexican writer who writes about tortillas, or you can be the Mexican writer who writes about croissants. instead of the tortillas on their plate. Can you be a Mexican writer if you're allergic to corn? There's two ways to be a Mexican writer that are true and tested. You can write about migration, or you can write about migration. Can you be a Mexican writer if you never migrated, if your family never migrated? There's two ways to be a Mexican writer. You can translate from Spanish, or you can translate to Spanish, or you can refuse to translate altogether. There's only one wound in the Mexican writer's imagination, and it's the wound of the chancla. It's the wound of Bidia being sold out at the taco truck. It's the wound of too many dolores and not enough dollars. It can be argued that these are all chanclazos. Even death is a chanclazo. There's only one miracle gifted to Mexicans, and it is the miracle of never running out of cheap beer. It's the miracle of never running out of bad jokes. There's infinite ways to eat a tortilla, made in the ancient ways by hand and warmed on a comal, made with corn or with Taco Bell plastic. <laughs> they count. <laughs> what about flour tortillas? Flour tortillas count if you ask San Antonio. <laughs> My people, I am poly with the tortillas. <laughs> you can eat tortillas with your hands or roll them up and dip them in caldo like my mom does. You can eat them with a fork and knife like my bougie cousins do. What bougie cousins? I made them up for the purpose of this poem. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can eat tortillas in tacos or warmed up by microwave and drizzled with butter. Tortillas con arroz, tortillas con frijoles. Tortillas flipped by hand or tortillas flipped with a spatula. Tortillas with eggs for breakfast. Tortillas fried and sprinkled with sugar for dessert. Hard shell tortillas. Gluten-free tortillas for our mixed family. <laughs> <laughs> We are still discovering new ways to fold a tortilla, to cut a tortilla up, to transform a tortilla into new worlds, to feed each other with tortillas. My people, if I have children, I will teach them about tortillas, but I'm sure they'll want McDonald's. <laughs> Jose Olivares, reading from Promises of Gold here on Livewire. Uh, you talk about translation in that poem, and the the layout of this book is really interesting. So uh, it's half of it is uh, in English. Well, it's the same poems, but in English, and then the other side is in Spanish. So you flip it over to read whichever side you're reading. Did you always have that in mind for this book? That idea came from doing community workshops with bilingual students and bilingual families. And what I would find is, you know, I would give readings to students who were fluent in both English and Spanish, and that would be great. But then I would give workshops that included their parents, and the parents only spoke Spanish. And so I would do those workshops in Spanish, and those were also great. But the parents would come up to me afterwards, and they'd be like, you know, we wish we could also read your poems alongside our kids, but we only read in Spanish. And so that, for me, made me remember that, like, for example, in my education, when I was reading James and the Giant Peach, I could never like bring that story home to my parents and ask them to read along with me or tell them about what I was reading, right? And so my hope was to offer something that might be useful to those families. That's such a great idea. I I read the, the English side and then I actually enjoyed reading some of the Spanish side yeah. with my very limited high school Spanish to just see the way the words work. Yeah. And it's just such a beautiful thing to see. Uh, but there's a, a note from the translator in the book. I'm curious... You speak Spanish, but did you have the poems translated into Spanish? Yeah, so I worked with a translator named David Ruano Gonzalez, who's a poet from Mexico City. And the reason I worked with the translator is because, like I mentioned, I studied in English. And so that's really the language that I feel most comfortable with being creative and kind of mm. thinking academically in at this point. Um, so when it came time to translate my poems, like I could... I could get a rough estimation, but to do it with the kind of precision and art mm. that poetry requires and the musicality, I really needed to kind of lean on David. Do you have conversations with your translator when he's like working through the book about the things that aren't necessarily there in a word-to-word -word translation, like you said, the art? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way, I mean, you could kind of tell from that poem, right? But I like to write in vernacular and kind of really draw out the music of the everyday. That's something that's really beautiful to me. And so David would have questions because he'd be like, you know, I Googled this word. <laughs> and, uh, bougie. Yeah, yeah, bougie. And it's just, it's not making sense to me. And so then I'd have to like explain it to him and he'd be like. Do you like, remember where it landed on the Spanish side, what we did with bougie? Yeah, yeah. Los primos, los muy muy, I think is what. Okay. Los muy muy. Nice. Los muy muy, yeah. Nice. Um, the, the poem that we had you read, you talked about there being sort of two ways to be a, a Mexican poet. Do you feel constrained at times by an expectation about how you might be as a poet who is Mexican-American? Like if you just don't necessarily want to write about something related to that experience on a given day? Yeah, kind of. I remember, so in my first book, there's, a, you know, there's also basketball poems. And I remember sometimes being asked by audience members, like, in a book that is about immigrations and its discontents, why is there a poem about Scottie Pippen? <laughs> and I'd be like, because I like Scottie Pippen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. it's, it's just, so yeah, I think there's this expectation that those of us who have marginalized identities that mm -hmm. we kind of write about it in this one particular way. Mm -hmm. And for me, I wanna think about like, how I present those pains and then also, you know, what I want to share and what I don't. And in that, what I might gain by, by surprising people and reminding them that even through those moments of struggle and pain, that there's always a lot of joy and song and dance. Yeah. Uh, you have a quote in the book from um, Eduardo Galeano saying, utopia is 
is on the horizon and basically you take 10 steps towards it and it takes 10 steps down the horizon. I'm curious, what keeps you walking? What keeps me walking is, you know, like a belief that just because things are one way right now, that it doesn't mean that they've always been this way and it doesn't mean that they have to continue to be this way. So I really believe that through imagination, we can start to think and really build a world where things are different for us. And you can see those little victories from time to time where even underneath all of this oppressive weight, there's something that we're constructing that we're slowly making bigger and bigger. Could we sneak one more poem in? Yeah. I would love for folks... Maybe maybe something on the uh, on the shorter side just for time, but but anything that you might want to pick. Yeah, thank you. I'll read a love poem. Uh, this is a poem I wrote for my wife Erica. It's called "Love Poem Beginning with the Yellow Cab." Hmm. I ask you, what's the first thing you think about when you see the color yellow, and like a real New Yorker, you say yellow cabs, not sunlight or a yellow ribbon tied around a vase of fresh begonias, yellow cabs honking down Broadway. I still remember the night we first shared a cab. You whispered honey, whispered lace, whispered chrysanthemum, all that practice. And it turns out I had never ridden in a cab the right way. (laughs) Around us, the street lights blurred into yellow ribbons, And when you put your hand on my thigh, it was like I knew for the first time why God gave us thighs. (laughs) Why God gave us hands. Maybe God invented yellow for the cabs. So the first time we touched like this, it could be accented in gold. My goodness. That's a love poem. Jose Olivares, thank you so much for coming on LiveWire. The book is Promises of Gold. Thank you. That was Jose Olivares right here on LiveWire, his latest collection of poetry. Promises of Gold is available now. I'm Luke Burbank. That's Elena Passarella right over there. And you are listening to LiveWire. We've got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we get back, we'll get some music from the incredible Danielle Ponder. Stay with us. Welcome back to Live Wire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. As we do each week, of course, we've asked our listeners a question. Uh, in honor of the uh, book Raw Dog by Jamie Loftus, where she road trips around the country, we asked our listeners, what's your ideal road trip? Elena has been collecting up those responses. What are you seeing? This is an ambitious one from Justin. Hmm. My goodness. Okay. Justin says the ideal road trip involves my besties, impeccable Wi-Fi, edibles, a karaoke <laughs> machine, board and card games, mimosas, a lit charcuterie board, and any destination as long as there is a self-driving car. <laughs> wow. I think Justin needs to look into a party bus. Yeah, I think he might be describing. That's what's being yeah. described. Yeah, and, and a chauffeur maybe might do a little better than a self-driving car with all the antics that are happening on that <laughs> epic road trip. Yeah, definitely make sure you've got somebody or some other machine driving that thing. Uh, what's another dream road trip for one of our listeners? Oh, well, this one is from a familiar sounding name. It's from Tunvi. Yay, Tunvi. Tunvi Kumar, our outgoing production fellow. Love you, Tunvi. We've appreciated so much during her time here. Well, uh, Tunvi's ideal road trip, she might be taking it, you know, very soon, is one with someone I love who doesn't mind taking a bunch of detours to check out random attractions, bonus points if I get to control the music, and double bonus points if they don't make me drive. (laughs) Yeah! (laughs) (laughs) I feel like people fall into one of two categories, uh, which is the enjoyment of a road trip is not having to be the driver, or... It's not enjoyable if you can't be the driver. And I am definitely more on the control freak side of things. I did an RV trip with my buddy once from Seattle to Austin. Whoa. 
He never touched the steering wheel. Ah, uh, wow. I drove the entire, and that wasn't the plan going in. It's just, and it kept being like, hey, man, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to hand the keys over, that's fine. I'm like, I'm good. I'll do a couple more hours. I think low key, I was just <laughs> worried <laughs> about him being able to operate it. Well, when David and I road trip from Austin to Oregon, I never touched the steering wheel. I think this, the key to doing that is, to be such a bad driver, someone would rather drive 2,200 <laughs> miles solo than have you behind the wheel. But you enjoy getting to just be like ride along. I think on TikTok, they call that passenger princess. Yeah. And also I, I like to travel with my cats. So there's often ah. like cats to wrangle <laughs> while that's happening. <laughs> Do you let your cats free range sometime in the car? Yeah. They, you know, they all, but one of them prefers it. Uh, uh, we haven't taken a road trip with them in a long time, but they kind of seem, they like to just sit on my lap and uh, like curl up in a ball and just wait. That's Bubbles' whole move. I mean, uh, people will email us. I don't know about the legality of this, but Bubbles uh, really likes to just ride along in the car, and she's generally okay. She's generally well-behaved, so that's kind of been our system for now. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you to everyone who wrote in with answers to our question. we got another listener question for next week's show coming up in just a minute, and we're going to get some music from Danielle Ponder, so stick around for all that. I do want to tell you what's coming up on the program next week. We're going to be talking to Ginny Hogan about her path to comedy. It's one of those classic stories, Elena. A data scientist at a mayonnaise company starts blogging about their online dates and end up having a career in comedy writing. Her latest book is I'm More Dateable Than a Plate of Refried Beans. You know, um, dare to dream is what I would say. Uh, Then we're going to hear from Oregon's Poet Laureate, our friend Anise Mojgani, His poems uh, tend to literally bring me to tears when he's on the show uh, reading them for us. Uh, Then we're also going to hear some music from another Livewire favorite who actually became a lot of people's favorite during his very impressive run on the TV show America's Got Talent. It's Jimmy Harrod. We'll be hearing from him as well. And as always, we want to get your answers to our listener question. Elena, what are we asking the Livewire fans for next week's show? We want to know, what is your biggest dating red flag? (laughs) What's yours? Well, mine is they cannot be imaginary. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fairly low bar. Yeah. Uh, Also, they have to like my husband, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And does David have to like them? (laughs) These are all important questions around red flags. If you've got an answer to that question, uh, go ahead and hit us up on Facebook or Twitter. We are at... Livewire Radio. This is Livewire from PRX. Our musical guest this week turned to a career in law after her brother received a 20 year three strikes prison sentence. She served as a public defender in her hometown of Rochester, New York. But this whole time she was still playing music in numerous bands and eventually took a leap of faith to leave the public defender's office and focus on her songwriting. Written and recorded over three years, her mesmerizing debut album, which is called Some of Us Are Brave, received critical acclaim and has earned her new fans all over the country. This is Danielle Ponder, right here on Livewire. First of all, thank you to both of you for flying all the way out here from Rochester, New York, today to do this. We appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for having us. What song are we going to hear? I'm going to do this song called So Long, which is a song I wrote uh, when I went to L.A. and felt like I I didn't belong and kind of had imposter syndrome. And like most of my songs, it was what I needed to survive the moment. Um, And I dedicate this to all artists and creatives who might feel like it's too late for them. I signed my first record deal at 39. I did my thank you. My first U.S. tour was at 40, and um, here I am now. So, uh, yes, it's called So Long. This is Danielle Ponder with Avis Reese here on Livewire. I feel it when the sun don't shine. Hold my head and I clear my mind to shame me. Shave me. I won't hide, no, I won't play small. I stay grounded, I can never fall. You won't shake me, you'll never shake me. And I don't care what people say, I'll do 
That was Danielle Ponder here on Livewire. Her album, Some of Us Are Brave, is available now. That's going to do it for this week's episode of the show. A huge thanks to our guests, Jamie Loftus, Jose Olivares, and Danielle Ponder. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. And our producer and editor is Melanie Sevchenko. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer. And our house sound is by B. Neil Blake. Trey Hester is our assistant editor. Rosa Garcia is our operations associate. Tunvi Kumar is our outgoing production fellow. Yay, Tunvi! And Julian McElmurray is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Additional funding provided by the Oregon Arts Commission, a state agency funded by the state of Oregon, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff. This week, we'd like to thank members Mark and Jamie Luce of Muckle Teo, Washington. For more information about our show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to livewireradio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole Livewire crew. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next week. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a piping hot episode of Livewire delivered right to your heart and ears each week? Well, guess what? That can happen when you subscribe to the Livewire podcast feed and you'll get the joy of surprising conversation every week. So go ahead and do it. It's super easy. You click on the button at the top of your podcast app and bam, you are Livewire subscribed. And if you're still, you know, feeling the love, if you're enjoying the show, hey, maybe you could hook us up and uh, leave us a quick review. That'll help more people find out about Livewire. And thank you.